Because here's what leaders really do. They maximize resources. A leader can come into an organization that's totally torn up in horrible shape, take the same resources, take it to another level. Your body, your mind, your emotion, but you can't maximize it when you're trying to fit in. And you can't maximize it when you live by everybody else's rules. I'm not saying don't be respectful. I'm just saying as a leader, you've got to decide what you believe is right. And one thing I can tell you will always feel right. To never settle for less than you can be, do, share, or give. That'll feel right as long as you're inside your life. Oh, yes. So question, how do you build muscle? Because what we want to leave here with is not some just positive attitude BS. We don't want to just leave here with some material we wrote in our books. We want to leave here with a different sense of identity, strength, and muscle. And I don't just mean just physical muscle. I mean emotional muscle. Because think about how do you build a muscle? What do you do? No, no. Exercising a muscle is how you keep it. If you don't use it, you... Faith unused, faith unemployed does not grow, it diminishes, true? Courage that's inside of you, that after a while you don't use your courage, you don't make yourself do it. The courage muscle doesn't get bigger, it gets smaller. Passion between a couple, you're so busy and you're so tired, unexpressed, after a while that passion dwindles, sometimes moves to seemingly nothing for people that really do love each other. But what's happened is they just haven't used the muscle, it's so weak, it's like where would we even start? Right? That process happens in all human beings. And the emotional muscles are the one that shape every leader in every part of this world. Because everything that's happening in this world is an emotional game. 911 was an emotional game. Twelve guys took down a five trillion dollar economy for a few days, shut down the air transport system, and put the word terrorism, fear, and uncertainty into 255 million Americans. I don't support it. But one thing drove it. Emotion. It wasn't intellect. They used their intellect to its maximum capacity for bad, for destruction, from our perception. Certainly mine, I would, you'd probably agree with me. But on the other hand, there are a group of people that are on a plane who use that same emotion to get themselves from a place of total fear to saying the phrase, let's roll. And those people, Todd Beam and those people there, Those people use that emotion to give their lives also, but to protect life. Protect what probably would hit the White House. To change that piece. Those people put their lives on the line because they activated the emotion. They didn't sit there emotionally unfit, hanging out in their chairs hoping, or worrying, or fearing just for themselves. They figured out there's something we gotta do and we're gonna do it now. Muscle, emotional muscle, that's what'll change your life. 80% of success in life 80% of achievement in business, 80% of almost anything that matters in your life is psychology and 20% is mechanics. How to get fit physically is not that complex. There are a million classes, courses, programs, elements, internet elements. There's a gym on every corner. There's a trainer anywhere nearby. How to do it, the mechanics, is not that complex. So how come the vast majority of people on this planet, I should say, the vast majority of Americans, not the planet, because most people don't have enough money to be like people here. We're the most obese nation in the history of the world. We're physically fat because we're emotionally fat. Because what it takes is will. People tell me all the time, diet and exercise, you have a great life. That's a two-legged stool. It won't stand. You need the third element. The third leg is emotional fitness, psychological strength, the capacity to drive yourself to do what doesn't feel good initially but feels incredible long term. That's what we're going to do here. The bottom line is, if leaders get results, and most people don't get results. Most people tell us a story, don't they? If you don't get the result, if people don't achieve their goal, they don't get the result, why don't they achieve it? What do most people tell us? What have we even said at times, if we're honest? You didn't achieve the goal, you didn't achieve your dream, you didn't achieve this thing. We as a company didn't do it because what? What's the reason people give? Tell me. We don't have the... Okay, we didn't have the money. What else? Tell me. Oh, we didn't have the time. Didn't, I didn't have enough time to achieve it. We don't have the res We don't have the people resource. Okay, we don't have the people. We don't have the computers. We don't have the technology. We don't have the tools. We don't have the right plan. We don't have a plan. My boss sucks. If it wasn't for my boss, we would have made it happen. Wrong leadership. Wrong management. 
What else? Oh, because uh, we, our people are too old. We don't have enough youth. So if you put them up on the screen here, people say things like, I don't have time, we don't have the money, we don't have the technology, the energy, not enough resource, we don't have the quality of leadership, we don't know the right people, we don't have the network, we, I don't have the education. That's why. Whenever people fail to achieve their goals 99.9% .9 of the time, and you ask them why, they'll tell you it's because of a lack of resources. That's what all these things are. I didn't have the support, right? I didn't have the money, we didn't have the time, we didn't have this, we didn't have that. There's a resource that people believe is missing. And that resource, belief structure, then keeps people from ever being able to really lead. Because what leaders do is they find a way to maximize whatever resources they have, as little as they may be, and they don't believe in limited resources. I'll give you an example. Let's take a business example to start with. In 1974, a guy named Sam Walton had built his little company up. He came up with an idea. He started with $20,000 in, I think, 1962, if I remember right. But by 1974, within 12 years, he had 78 stores. And you know how he did it? In the middle of the night, he'd drive across the border, and he'd go and study other people's stores. He'd buy everything the cheapest he could in the middle of the night. He'd go to other people's stores. Whatever was working, he figured out successfully his clues. He came back and did it in his store. Whatever was working in any store, in any competitor, anywhere he could do it, he did it. So he figured out how to maximize the little resources he had. It's 20,000, built 78 stores, and if you read any of the people following him, the company had gone public in that year, they were all saying, this is it. He's maximized his resources. I mean, he only has so much money. There's only so many cities that are going to appeal to this discounting mentality, right? This is it. This is all he can do. And the word on Wall Street was sell. Now, what's interesting is, at that time, you look at Sears, and Kmart, and they were gargantuan companies, weren't they? 20, 30, 40, 50 times, 100 times his size or more, probably. And at that time, they were the leaders, and they knew what's going to happen. But did things change, yes or no? Did he suddenly get mass amounts of capital? No. Here's what they didn't understand. Sam Walton now, or the Walton organization, Walmart, is the most successful retailing operation on earth. And when you talk about Bill Gates being the richest man in the world, that's only true because Sam's fortune is divided up amongst a bunch of different family members. You put them together, they dwarf Bill Gates. Sam Walton did this. How did he do it? What people underestimated is that this guy could go to 4,400 stores, do 250 billion. Where's Kmart today? And they've been shrinking, all of them have been shrinking. And he's the dominant force on earth. Here's the thing he understood. Resources are interesting, but the ultimate resources are the feelings of emotion that make you resourceful. Think of it this way. Resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. What do I mean? What are the emotions that make all this possible? What's the fuel that takes an idea from being in your head where you intellectually know what to do? How many have had an idea, for example, was a great idea, you're excited about it, and then you didn't do anything, and one day there you saw it on the shelf, you saw it somewhere, someone stole your idea. How many have had this happen? Say I. <laughs> the only difference between you and that person was not that they had more resources, they were more resourceful. What are the ultimate resources? They're emotions like vision. Creativity is a 